Star Wars has produced some of the most beloved films of all time, some of the most disappointing films of all time, and some of the most polarizing films of all time. And they've also had some wildly troubled productions where the final film is dramatically different from the script that was originally approved. So today we're gonna look at three Star Wars movies that need a director's cut. Hi, my name is Sean and I love to talk about movies way too much with that in mind. Go ahead and join me down below in the comment section. Let me know which Star Wars movies would you love to see a director's cut for or one of the alternate versions. Likewise, would you like to see more videos like this? As I go into this, when I say a director's cut, I mean a director was hired, shot a movie, and then somewhere during production, post-production, editing, things dramatically changed from the original vision that they were working towards. Obviously, there's some infamous other versions of some of the Star Wars films. Of course, George Lucas's sequel trilogy or Colin Trevorrow's episode nine, but those weren't shot, so they don't qualify as a director's cut, so they're not covered in this video but they could have their own video in the future. With that said, let's get started, and I am discussing these in release order. Kicking things off, episode three, Revenge of the Sith. George Lucas wanted to end the prequel trilogy on a bang. Very clearly, he always knew the general idea of this story going back decades, but exactly how he wanted to execute that story changed dramatically throughout the entire process. In fact, in the introduction to the officially released illustrated script, it says this, the script is the result of a rough draft in four subsequent drafts, all written before principal photography began in Sydney, Australia, as well as extensive revisions made during post-production, including new scenes added during the pickups. It then continues on in the next paragraph saying this. Not only did Lucas change the script from draft to draft, he altered it extensively in the editing room by moving scenes around, deleting some, adding others, and intercutting many. I like to really make the movie in the editing room. The editing process is much like the writing process for George. The cut is always changing. He will take it and mold it, shape it, sculpt it as much as possible to get it to work with what he has shot. The result of all of this was easily the best film in the prequel trilogy, and some of you would say one of the best Star Wars movies. But beyond that, it teases the potential for so much more. Between the script, the Blu-rays, the DVDs, there's extensive lists of deleted scenes, some of which we've seen others of which we've never seen a frame of. Typically speaking, the script is the Bible. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Where'd that come from? But uh, in this case, the script is just a starting off point. Some internet rumors have even suggested the original cut of the film was four hours long. But based on what's working or not working, he likes to be able to go back and shoot. These reshoots are scheduled way in advance to pick up scenes, sometimes just a single shot, or shoot entirely new scenes that weren't even conceived when we were in Sydney. But beyond that, Lucas, through interviews, said some of his ideas for what he wanted to do with the intro, the kind of thing of having a montage of the Clone World spread across seven different planets. Other rumors discuss how he dramatically shifted the nature of which uh, Anakin turns to the dark side and the order in which those scenes took place. It's well known that a whole subplot about the start of the rebellion was cut out of the movie. Likewise, the novelization expands on Anakin's turn to the dark side. It fleshes out the fact that he was having trouble sleeping and was having a lot of situations where he saw solutions to problems but the bureaucracy of the Jedi and their policies stopped him from being able to solve problems. In the final film, this was all simplified to him having a bad dream and being annoyed that he was added onto the council but not given a title. It was a much simplified version of a more compelling narrative and arc. As for me personally, 
Two of my biggest problems with the prequel trilogy is one, we didn't see enough of the Clone Wars, and two, the specific way in which Anakin turned just seemed way too rushed and I didn't buy into it. So the idea that potentially there was footage that was shot and scripted that would give us more of the Clone Wars and give Anakin a more compelling turn to the dark side all of that sounds great to me. Likewise, the idea of kind of laying the foundation for the rebellion in the film a little bit more directly, as we've seen from some of the deleted scenes, I think that that's a big, gigantic win. When you put all of this together, it sounds like they were so close to an even better, bigger, more epic, and more compelling conclusion to the prequel trilogy. Next up, Rogue One, a Star Wars story. All things considered, Rogue One is one of the better films that Disney Star Wars has put out, and in particular, the third act can be rather potent. But as soon as this movie came out, people immediately realized an enormous amount of footage was shown in the trailers that is nowhere to be seen at all inside of the final film. In particular, virtually none of the footage in the original teaser trailer is in the movie. Saw Gerrera gives a monologue in that trailer that doesn't seem like it fits particularly well with the actual narrative of the film. If you continue to fight, what will you become? The second trailer shows a footage of Darth Vader in a location he's not at in the film that was released in theaters. And there's all kinds of shots of the final battle that simply don't line up with the film that was released. In fact, if you compare the trailers to the movie sequence by sequence, frame by frame, it feels like every single element of this film was changed throughout the production. And I think there's three reasons for that. First off, during production, director Gareth Edwards wanted to fuel the crew's creative side by doing something called Indie Hour. We did these things at the end of a day shoot and we'd always ring fence an hour and we called it Indie Hour. It was just a way of the crew understanding like for an hour, we're just gonna do loads of random shit. And it would just be things that felt like, I think this is a beautiful moment, this is a great idea. Moments that they thought were neat, they would just film it and they had hours upon hours of this stuff that was given to the people that cut the trailers and they put these shots in the trailers even though many of them were never intended to be in the movie some of a lot of the stuff in the trailer ended up through that process like uh i don't know like felicity in the tunnel where the lights come on around her Second, during production, Gareth Edwards used a very unusual style in how he would film the scenes in which he would try and capture all the different emotions or vibes or tones that could apply to a different scene. Ben Mendelsohn in particular elaborated on this, how he would deliver each scene with wildly different emotions. So in the trailers, you have Ben Mendelsohn talking to Darth Vader with a cocky tone. The power that we are dealing with here immeasurable. Then when you see those same scenes in the movie itself, he's afraid and timid. You do have a great many things to explain. I delivered the weapon the Emperor requested. Likewise, if you look at the way Jin Erso interacts with the Rebel Alliance leadership, her attitude, her vibe, her energy wildly changes depending on which scene or trailer you are watching. This is a rebellion, isn't it? I rebel. We have hope. Rebellions are built on hope. And third, in post-production, it was decided the movie wasn't coming together, so they brought in Tony Gilroy to rewrite, reshoot, and restructure virtually the entire film. We don't know exactly what he added and changed to the film, but based off various different interviews, we've been told that Cassian's introduction as a spy that kills people was added in reshoots, as well as Jen Erso as a prisoner that's broken out added during reshoots. Based off the trailers, there's footage of a shaved head Saw Guerrero with Jen Erso and some of the footage and scenes that we've seen. And it seems like he's giving a monologue to train her. All of that was removed from the film. Raz Ahmed's character, he said in interviews that it was dramatically changed throughout the course of shooting and reshooting the film. And then as you move to the third act, apparently originally the location of 
the files, the data plans, and the tower to transmit them were two different locations. And so there's all these shots in the trailers and in the behind the scenes footage of Jin running across the battlefield to get to the second tower. Likewise, in some behind the scenes footage, we see characters dying in different locations. So stop and think about this. The first act was basically added in reshoots. The second act's central character, Saw Gerrera, his role in the film was dramatically changed. And the third act was very clearly totally reworked during the reshoots and post-production. All three acts dramatically changed. And Tony Gilroy himself wasn't exactly humble about all of this. This is what he said in an interview a year and a half after the movie came out. I came in after the director's cut. I have a screenplay credit in the arbitration that was easily won. And if you don't understand what he's saying there about arbitration at the end, there's formal processes by which it's decided who gets screenwriting credit and story credit when it comes to these big gigantic movies. And the fact that he came in after the entire movie was already shot and got screenwriting credit, that really is a big deal. But it raises a gigantic question. What was this movie originally? How did it start? What was Saw Gerrera doing? What was this third act? Do I think it would be a better movie? Eh, probably not. Am I absolutely curious what Gareth Edwards' original vision was, the original flow of this story? Absolutely, I would love to see it. And finally, Solo, A Star Wars Story. For me, this might be the most intriguing of the bunch because while we do have the theatrically released film, we haven't really seen any of the offending footage that led to there being two different versions of this film. We've heard all these rumors about what took place and what was happening and how it wasn't working, but we haven't seen any of that footage. So if you don't know what happened behind the scenes, when Lucasfilm was acquired by Disney, they set out to recruit a bunch of fresh, new, energetic storytellers, and this led them to Lord and Miller. Lord and Miller were some of the hottest names in Hollywood at the time because of the way they were able to take 21 Jump Street and turn it into this really funny comedy and they were able to take Legos. Legos? For God's sake, it's Lego, not Legos. And then 16 exclamation points. Friends, Lego is the singular and the plural. And they were able to take Legos and turn them into a movie that was beloved by audiences and critics and that made a whole lot of money. And therefore, Kathleen Kennedy spotted them and decided they were the right people to make a Star Wars movie. But at the same time that they brought in these fresh, new, energetic filmmakers, they also brought in Star Wars royalty, Lawrence Kasdan, to write the script. So they had a very traditional Star Wars screenwriter and very unconventional new young filmmakers. And apparently this led to a whole lot of trouble on the set. Lord and Miller wanted to have a very spontaneous set. Part of what they wanted to bring to the table was improv and letting the actors have a lot of freedom with the scenes. And so apparently they would have like 20, 30 takes just trying to see what could happen along the way. This led to a lot of delays, a lot of overtime and a lot of going over budget. And Lawrence Kasdan, Star Wars legend, being very unhappy as he was watching dailies of the actors just riffing and trying new things instead of sticking to the script that he has written. Now, where things start getting really interesting, According to some reports, people felt Alden Ehrenreich's performance more resembled Ace Ventura than Han Solo. May I tell you what I think happened? Alrighty then. And when Kathleen Kennedy heard this and saw this, she also was not very happy. And according to certain reports, Alden Ehrenreich was one of the primary voices saying, this isn't working, can you guys help me out? So reportedly after multiple warnings, multiple attempts to try and get Lord and Miller to tighten up their schedule, it didn't happen. They kept going over budget, over time. So just three 
weeks before they were scheduled to be finished shooting the film, they were fired. And of all the people that Kathleen Kennedy could hire, they go with Ron Howard. They start with Lord and Miller because they're so fresh and interesting. And they go with Ron Howard. If you don't know who Ron Howard is, he directed Willow back in the 1980s. George Lucas wanted to make a fantasy movie based off an original George Lucas story. So who did he get to direct it? Ron Howard. He's been a solid director for the last 35 years. If you're going to make a Star Wars movie, Ron Howard is about the safest director that you can possibly get. So Kathleen Kennedy goes from these two risky, energetic dudes to like the safest possible choice to make a Star Wars movie. So he goes to work on the film and by the end of his time working on it, he's shot 70% of the movie. One casualty of all of this is that originally Michael K. Williams was originally supposed to play Dryden Voss as an alien, but he couldn't come back for the reshoots or the extended production. Therefore, he had to be replaced and he was replaced with Paul Bettany, who's basically just playing a dude and his role in the film supposedly was changed a little bit and more simplified. But here's the deal with Solo. They didn't release any early footage. The first trailer came out just a few months before the film came out and the first full trailer was only weeks before the film came out. So all this stuff shot by Lord and Miller, we haven't seen any of it. We've only heard rumors and know that they were fired because it felt so far removed from what Star Wars normally is, which means I would love to see what they were up to, what they were working on. Because when you watch the final product, it feels like a safe, unnecessary Ron Howard Star Wars film. You don't really get any of the energy of Lord and Miller, any of their improv, their wacky comedy, save for maybe Lando's liberation robot that he has a relationship with. Besides that stuff, none of it feels like something that you might've gotten from Lord and Miller, which case, what were they up to? What were these scenes? How on earth do you have Alden Ehrenreich giving a Han Solo performance that's being compared to Ace Ventura? What was that? I would love to see footage of that. Do I think it would be good? I don't know. Do I think it'll fit in the Star Wars universe? Definitely not. I get why they had to make the change, but I don't know why Kathleen Kennedy was surprised that these guys made something that didn't feel like it would naturally fit in the Star Wars universe, but I get why they were fired eventually, but that doesn't change the fact. I would love to see what was this crazy movie that was so far off the mark that just three weeks before production was supposed to be finished, they were fired. How did it get that far into production before they were fired? And why were they fired at that point in time with only three weeks left? That's crazy to me on both regards. So I would love at some point in time for Mickey Mouse to approve the Lord and Miller cut to see this bizarre other version with that has an Ace Ventura-esque Han Solo in it. I'm sure it'll never happen, but I would love to see it. Hey, if you like this type of content, the channel Joe Blow has a series called WTF Happened, and they covered Rogue One and Solo. They were a big source for me putting this video together. Absolutely check those videos out. They are fascinating. I actually watch almost every single video in the WTF Happened series. Thank you so much for watching, and keep talking movies too much.